Hello, everyone. My name is George Dimakopoulos. I'm one of the co-directors of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University. I uh, hope everyone is doing well. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'm joined today by my friend uh, Natalia Vasilevich, and we're going to talk about um, a really troubling situation uh, that's occurring in Belarus. Um, and most, most, uh, most people in the English-speaking audience, for which we primarily surf, um, uh, may know some of these details in the abstract, but probably don't know what's going on, uh, on, on the ground and, and certainly don't know what role the Orthodox Church uh, is playing in, in the situation. Um, so we're just going to do a kind of give and take um, interview, really. I, I'm going to interview my friend. Um, let me introduce her uh, more properly uh, and, and we'll just jump right in. So Natalia Vasilevich, is born in Minsk in Belarus, is currently residing in Bonn, Germany, where she is completing her doctoral dissertation on the preconciliar process of the Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church, which occurred in Crete in 2016. Uh, she's looking specifically at how the council dealt with the mission of the church in today's world. She's trained in political science and law and works interdisciplinarily uh, combining her previous education with Orthodox theology with an aim to develop contemporary political theology based on the Orthodox theological resources. She is actively involved in the ecumenical movement. She is editor-in-chief of the Belarusian uh, theological journal uh, Zubosa, I'm not sure I pronounced that properly, uh, since 2020. Um, and she is moderator of Christian Vision, uh, a group of the Coordinated Council of the Belarusian uh, Democratic Movement. So uh, welcome, uh, Natalia. Uh, th thanks for joining us. Um, and I would like to, let, let's just begin, um, ex explain for our audience, if you will, um, where did this crisis come from? What exactly is going on? We know some things have changed in the last week or so. So just uh, update us on, on what the situation is. Uh, okay, hello everyone, and uh, I would like first uh, to explain the situation in general, what happens, why Belarus, uh, why uh, migration crisis, and uh, what is the role the churches play. Uh, first of all, uh, I need to mention that Belarus is a country in uh, uh, Central or Eastern Europe, and uh, um, this country is ruled since 1994 uh, by authoritarian leader Alexander Lukashenko. And uh, last year, 2020, uh, there was a great upheaval, civil upheaval, uh, and uh, it, we called it revolution, but it was not completed yet, ongoing process of revolution, uh, when uh, people um, uh, started to protest and uh, uh, elections were severely uh, stolen, and uh, there were protests uh, happening long, long time. And uh, in, in response uh, to violence and to lawlessness, and to, uh, as we call, legal default, uh, when no uh, laws anymore uh, could operate, no rule of law, um, the Western democracies imposed sanctions to the regime of Lukashenko and sanctions uh, to, to main uh, figures of the regime who are responsible for uh, stealing the votes, for uh, violence, and uh, also for uh, other kind of uh, anti-democratic steps against people. Uh, and uh, um, the, the last package of, uh, of the last package of uh, sanctions was adopted uh, after Ryanair flight was forcibly landed uh, in Belarus on pretext of bomb. Uh, uh, there was some kind of uh, pretext which uh, uh, everyone is laughing about, but there was a one democratic activist and journalist on this uh, plane, and that was the real reason why the plane was landed uh, in, uh, uh, against all uh, international regulations. So in response to this um, act of uh, regime, of the regime, because it also was not only about the Belarusian people suffering from violence and uh, being political prisoners and and so on, but it also was a security of the 
of whole Europe because this air a space uh, where planes uh, uh, operated the common space and in a certain way it was an act of the regime against uh, the whole security in the European continent and that's why the new sanctions were imposed very strong sanctions uh, for example the the uh, air the uh, air um, uh, were closed the, there were no flights. Uh, uh, over Belarus, which uh, fly to Europe, uh, and uh, also some economic sanctions were already uh, also imposed. And uh, in response to this, Lukashenko said to, to the European countries that uh, if you do the sanctions against us, we, we are not going to stop uh, migration uh, to your countries anymore. Uh, but the thing is, there were never uh, strong migration, uh, transit uh, migration uh, via Belarus to European countries because of geographical uh, position of Belarus. It has border with European Union, but it has no border with any countries from where this great flows of migration go to Europe. So to get via Belarus to Europe, you need to have a Belarusian visa, you need to take a flight and then come and uh, cross the border. So just naturally it was not working. Like for example, in Turkey, which has borders with uh, uh, other Middle East countries, and so the flow uh, um, was great uh, there. Yeah. But in Belarus, you couldn't expect this kind of flow by natural ways. Uh, so uh, it was organized by the regime, uh, issuing visas uh, to citizens of Iraq, of Syria, the, uh, organizing a lot of flights uh, to Minsk, uh, also because, you know, there are no other flights, basically because uh, yeah, the sanctions uh, do not allow this. And um, uh, so the all flights started to be between Belarus and Middle East, and the migrants were coming more and more. And when it was summer, uh, and this uh, route was not yet uh, uh, well um, organized. There were not so many of them, and uh, they were coming uh, to Belarus. It was a, a whole touristic package, uh, travel to the border, as, as they call. Uh, the countries which we have uh, border with, uh, Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia, uh, they were not prepared uh, even to see such a small uh, flow of uh, migrants. Uh, and so the, the borders were not really uh, defended. Uh, so the Belarusian, from Belarusian side, they were cutting the fence, uh, let uh, people go through. And that's how one by one individuals were crossing the borders and asking asylum in uh, uh, these European countries. So uh, th th this is very helpful. So um, tell me, how many people are we talking about? D do we know? Yeah, so in beginning, uh, uh, for example, in Lithuania, if in previous years it was like around uh, 500 people every year who were crossing border with, with this aim, uh, now it, it became 10 times more, like uh, for around 5,000 uh, people who crossed. Uh, so because also this country will never transit countries to Germany, because of course people uh, try to, let, to get to wealthy countries of the European Union, uh, so they also want wanted to use Poland and Lithuania uh, right. before uh, for, for transit. Uh, but uh, uh, now, uh, because they ask asylum in these countries, and according to Dublin regulation, they uh, must stay in the country they ask for asylum. Uh, so they uh, had to stay in Poland and Lithuania, and there were no facilities for this. So the first phase of the crisis, uh, first of all, was um, crisis for these Baltic countries or uh, for Poland, because they couldn't uh, arrange uh, this uh, new growing flow of migrants, uh, but still it was easier uh, because there were uh, democratic uh, countries who took care of the migrants and also churches in uh, Poland and Lithuania, which are strong and which are very independent also because they are very Catholic countries and the role of Roman Catholic Church is very strong because they can play very independent uh, policy. Uh, so these churches, they provided aid and Orthodox churches in these countries also helped. Uh, I don't know if in the United States you have Caritas, uh, this organization of aid. It's, it's very big Catholic organization, so it could provide uh, immediate uh, needs of people, but also they could provide advocacy for people, which is very, very important when we come back to Belarus. 
the advocacy, uh, so they were even speaking to their uh, people, to citizens of their countries, uh, uh, not to start uh, xenophobic moods, like yeah. trying to say we need to be welcoming. And second, to speak with the um, uh, governments, saying that the life of person is more important than security of the border. So that's humanitarian aspect of advocacy in the uh, in, in these countries in Poland and Lithuania were very, very strong. So cardinals, bishops were speaking to the politicians that we need to find a solution uh, uh, where the first place, the first priority would be uh, life, dignity of human person. All right. Thank you. Okay. So I want to speak about the what's happening with the Orthodox Church and the government in, in Belarus. But before I do that, um, not everyone may know this, but one of the issues is that uh, these people who now they've all come, right? They, they've, they've literally been invited, <laughs> maybe clandestinely, but they've been invited by the Belarusian government, right? They, they've become these pawns in this game, so, so to speak. Um, but they've come as migrants, not refugees, right? And 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 that makes a difference, right? Because they're by a by a traditional definition, a refugee is someone who is fleeing uh, their homeland because of either some natural disaster or or political unrest or because of who they are, they've been targeted, and so they're fleeing for political purposes. Whereas a migrant is usually seeking economic opportunity and the, and the way, you know, a better job, a better life and, and so forth. Um, but some of the rules regarding who the Europeans let in and who they don't, this definition of migrant versus refugee is very important. Is that correct? Uh, uh, yes, there is the, the difference, but there is also international standards which require that everyone can apply uh, for the status of uh, refugee, uh, this asylum seeker. Uh, and the uh, government uh, should not decide who can apply or who not. They must accept all applications. And mm -hmm. then if uh, the application is not uh, correct or a person didn't have enough reasons to do this, they send the person back to the port uh, back. But they cannot just uh, stop someone uh, on the ground that we don't want, uh, we see from your face that you are not uh, eligible for, for this position. And uh, that's um, from human rights perspective, it's very important. But also when we speak about uh, the demographic characteristics of uh, migrants uh, and refugees, of course, we cannot use this uh, definition now because we don't know every concrete story of a person. Right. But if you come from Syria, it's evidence that it's conflict zone. If right. there is a Kurdic people from Iraq, it's also uh, ethnic, uh, uh, like situation of uh, Kurdic uh, people is not also very, uh, let's say, uh, stable in, in, in this country. So is, there is ethnic uh, um, uh, conflicts and uh, some discrimination. Uh, so that's why uh, there are, these groups are still vulnerable groups. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, I would think that uh, by uh, um, uh, it's, it's better to consider them refugees until it's uh, proved uh, that they are not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so tell us about the church, right? So, uh, first of all, give us a little bit of background, right? You, 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 you've been arguing, and I, I'm not going to disagree with you, but that Belarus has an authoritarian government. Um, we know that in some parts of the Orthodox world, um, the church really, out of self-preservation, aligns itself with authoritarian governments, um, at, at certain points in history. So give us a little bit of context of the relationship between the church and the state in Belarus, and, and then tell us specifically what the church is doing uh, in, in this crisis. Yeah, if I may uh, return back a little bit, because I said about the first phase of migration crisis, uh, and this uh, first phase was had aimed to uh, scare European countries uh, with this uh, irregular migration, just letting people go that the countries are scared for budget, uh, for uh, security, for, for, for the border uh, reasons. Uh, but uh, it didn't really work, so the sanctions were not uplifted. Um, so now what uh, the second phase, uh, which started when cold weather started, it started to be very difficult to cross the border. Uh, it's very risky for life and uh, uh, for health. 
many people, there are people who died already. Uh, there are people who stayed in 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 woods uh, or in swamp between two borders. Um, so this crisis starts to be very humanitarian because it uh, puts people in risk of their health and um, even their life. Uh, and uh, 8th of November, uh, this escalation phase started when uh, all, all of them, they were brought, many of them, like several thousand, were brought in one spot uh, and uh, led in the woods uh, and uh, uh, in uh, very bad conditions. Uh, and that's new, uh, like first Lukashenko tried to scare Europe with migration. And now uh, he rather uh, tried to use this uh, humanitarian uh, value-based uh, um, manipulation uh, to make people suffer that Europeans would uh, have pity on them and just say, no, no, let us save them. So that's, that's uh, like a little bit another strategy. Yeah. And yeah. so people, uh, now there are like uh, really thousands of people who are uh, in bad conditions uh, and uh, also COVID, uh, we, we should not uh, forget about COVID, uh, all of them they are together, uh, very difficult to get uh, medical help and of course uh, uh, there is no social distancing and uh, so on. Uh, so the situation is very, very bad uh, there. But now we come to, to the churches and really also Orthodox Church in Belarus never was a strong uh, player of civil society. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit allied itself with, uh, it, it had special agreement with the government. Uh, and for this agreement, uh, they were mainly cooperating with the governmental um, uh, agents. Um, but uh, uh, last year with this upheaval, social upheaval, it also touched very strongly Orthodox Church and the uh, independent voices of bishops, priests and uh, lay people uh, arise, the people who didn't agree with the violence especially. Uh, um, and uh, so that was a, a big group of uh, uh, people. We are estimating like around 100 priests uh, and uh, one bishop and uh, many lay people who uh, were very much involved in the democratic movement uh, still are. Uh, but the, there was a like a, a backlash from from the go uh, government, from the Lukashenko, from the regime, because he always uh, felt this the church should be loyal to the regime, and it was loyal. There was no uh, expectation that one day the church will, as a priest, will go to protests. Uh, and uh, will uh, condemn uh, government for violence. Uh, so um, Lukashenko was very jealous about this and he started uh, um, to make a big pressure to the church. Uh, so uh, last year we experienced a lot of pressure. Two priests, uh, Orthodox priests, are refugees now uh, in, in different countries. One bishop who spoke up, uh, Bishop, uh, Archbishop Artemy of Grodna, uh, was, uh, was forcibly released from health reason from his position. Uh, the Metropolitan of Minsk changed uh, in August, uh, two weeks after the elections. So we really had a lot of steps uh, from the government to stop church, to, uh, to uh, present alternative voice. Uh, however, many people still have, at least they don't have voice because uh, the um, level of, oppress of uh, repression is unbelievable. Uh, we have around 1,000 1, political prisoners and including also Orthodox priests, family of Orthodox priests who are political prisoners. And uh, so you can imagine that uh, any um, independent voice now in Belarus are under attack of, from government. You speak, you just go to prison. It's not just a small uh, uh, problem. It's, it's really, really big problem for you if you try to speak. And uh, so that's why all grassroots initiatives also were blocked. And um, uh, that's why now the church again, there is a big, we, we made a survey uh, or that lay people and priests, they don't trust, many of them, they don't trust to, to bishops uh, yeah. in, in the course. And, and just, just for clarification, the church in Belarus is part of the Moscow Patriarchate? Yes, it's part of the Moscow Patriarchate. Okay, yeah. is it, is it uh, do, you, do you know this term autonomous? Is, is no. it auto autonomous? No, no. no, it's directly, it's directly governed by Moscow. 
Yeah, it is. It's called exer hate. Uh, okay. So uh, the uh, like nothing can uh, happen without a decision from Moscow, and Moscow can okay. easily change uh, the head of the church, and so it's very dependent on, on Moscow. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, now I think it's not. Uh, it's much more dependent now to the Belarusian regime than to Moscow, and um, uh, so everything now the church does and. Now the regime tries to get revenge uh, and uh, try uh, to put uh, uh, church again under its domination and even to instrumentalize it uh, more and more. And not only Orthodox, but also Roman Catholic Church. And uh, uh, he tries to communicate uh, via churches uh, its message both to people of Belarus and also to international arena. Uh, so now this uh, there was an appeal uh, of the religious leaders uh, from Belarus uh, to European uh, governments uh, about this migration crisis, uh, which was not even written by them. They came to meeting in the, we have plenty potential for religious affairs. And so they received a message which they need to sign. Uh, last year, they signed several messages uh, in the name of regime, like on their own name, but the content was provided by regime. And um, yeah, that, that, that's what what was done now um, uh, by... So it's, it's not independent voice, it's rather voice of government in religious rhetoric. Uh, but there are still uh, some uh, smaller um, aid campaigns uh, on, on a parish level, on a uh, diocese level where people just collect uh, goods for, for migrants, but it's also, we cannot say it's independent uh, campaign from the church because uh, now uh, on the governmental level, uh, so, so in Belarus every initiative is uh, forbidden. If you do it from your own motivation, uh, from your own will, it's forbidden even if wow. it, uh, it coincides with the government. It's better for government if you do it uh, against your will, but in the framework of the governmental policy. Uh, so now governments started campaign to collect goods and money uh, from people of Belarus. Like they, they sent from up to bottom how much you must provide and uh, collect it in centralized way. So in certain sense, uh, for, for, for the Orthodox Church, it's the same. Uh, it's, uh, it's, they are allowed to participate in, this, uh, in the old national campaign of aid, uh, let's say like this. And uh, um, uh, so that's, uh, that, uh, of course, we have many people who are very much interested in diaconic work and who like to provide, uh, but for the moment it's not possible. It's not possible in, in, in general because the whole society, uh, in, uh, you can imagine we have NGOs, uh, almost 300 NGOs, uh, where uh, the registration of them will withdrawn. Uh, NGOs who help uh, disabled people, uh, animals, yeah. ecological issues, and so on, uh, just because the government tries to um, destroy everything which is independent, mass media, yeah. and, so, and so on. So the churches are in the same um, category. And uh, probably if you, uh, maybe for, for in, in United States, uh, you don't know um, that there are, uh, we have in, in Eastern and Central Europe, go NGO, governmental, non-governmental organizations. Yeah. So it's like para uh, NGOs. Uh, okay. Which are uh, yeah, it's it's like uh, commun Komsomol uh, in in so in Soviet times, yeah. uh, like youth organization. The, the same now, church in in a certain sense plays it's go a religious organization, governmental. Yeah, religious yeah, yeah, organization. yeah. It's yeah. A, I, I mean it, it for, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like the situation isn't very di like the authoritarianism isn't very different from the Soviet period. Right. Um, it, it's just that the church, the church exists and, and, and the state aligns itself with the church in a way that it wouldn't in the Soviet period. But in terms of control, um, it, it doesn't seem to be all that different. Yeah, probably if the, the only topic during Soviet times for the church was a peace 
uh, discussions. You know, yes. the church was used, instrumentalized by uh, Soviet government to go everywhere in, and speak about peace and how important is peace and demilitarization and so on. And at the same time, to to uh, witness uh, that there are no uh, religious persecutions in the Soviet Union. Uh, and in certain sense, now uh, just the repertoire of uh, topics became larger and um, uh, government wants to instrumentalize the church in the same way and uh, uh, to um, speak with the uh, West uh, and to speak with their uh, own people uh, and also to pro uh, because now government also uh, there is a crisis of legitimacy of the government uh, Lukashenko has a big crisis of legitimacy because no one recognizes uh, him yeah. Yeah. and uh, so he tries to find at least some sources of legitimacy what, where, wherever he can and one of the sources um, can be also churches churches sure. Sure. yeah like churches bless uh, uh, president uh, for his uh, activities right. and pray for him and so on and recognize him as a legal and legitimate ruler of the country yeah, yeah. so okay. that's yeah that's, that's so so we only have a couple minutes left um if you could for us tell us um what you think is going to happen um, and, and maybe differentiate that from what you think should happen. Uh, yeah, we uh, as a Christian vision group, so what is Christian vision and say a few words, it's a group of uh, priests, uh, theologians and lay activists uh, from uh, Orthodox uh, Catholic Roman and Greek Catholic and uh, evangelical churches in Belarus, uh, who tried in the course of this uh, civil upheaval uh, or this revolution to provide the theological vision of uh, what happens, uh, to provide some uh, ideas what should happen on the value-based uh, approach. And um, uh, so uh, now I think, first of all, it's very important to uh, understand that uh, ecumenical dimension is very important in Belarus in, in, in this level. It's, we, we deal with the same problems and uh, uh, this branding uh, uh, of um, confessional branding is not anymore uh, as important as the brand, branding of Christian, being Christian and act Christian in a Christian way. And now I think we really uh, have uh, this new uh, ecumenical openness, sincere ecumenical openness. Uh, second, um, uh, we uh, provide uh, some ideas uh, and we, uh, we um, uh, have uh, a special appeal or statement on the migration crisis uh, in which uh, uh, we uh, speak about humanitarian aspect of crisis and the need to help people not only with immediate aid but also on long-term perspective. Um, um, and also um, because Lukashenko wants to move attention from political prisoners, for example, in Belarus, we try uh, to explain that the problem is not um, uh, the, the concrete, is, so the problem is it's only part of mosaic. It's one, one stone of mosaic. And to solve the problem, we need to see the whole mosaic. Uh, and uh, really it's Lukashenko, which who is source of, who is troublemaker and not yeah. uh, who solves the problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, what I think will happen, uh, I, I already noticed uh, that uh, there is a growing consensus in the European countries, um, the growing consensus that Lukashenko is dangerous. Uh, it's not, not migrants who are dangerous for Europe, but Lukashenko is much more dangerous for Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, also on, in, on the level of churches, like Roman Catholic Church uh, in Germany, in Lithuania, in Poland, uh, speaks strongly uh, ab 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 about uh, the situation and uh, blames and condemns Lukashenko uh, for uh, uh, what he does, instrumentalization of migrants. Uh, they are um, uh, like putting them in a very bad situation uh, without any pity to the tragedies of people, but also doing the same with uh, own people, not own, own is, he does not own uh, people like, by, but people of Belarus. Uh, like he really, what he does, it's already over just a uh, mild authoritarian regime. It's uh, really presents um, danger for, for in the sense of European civilization and the basis uh, of democracy, human rights, rule of law, and so on. And also of security of the, of the whole Europe. 
so uh, I think this this uh, um, uh, the, the the aims Lukashenko tried to achieve uh, with uh, the creation of artificial creation of this migration uh, crisis will, will be the something would be this something very different opposite what he expected. Uh, yeah. So yeah. he will be even more uh, condemned and not recognized. But I have also big hope for churches because uh, also for the Orthodox Church in Belarus because I see uh, how lay movements start to appear, how people start to uh, support, to do solidarity together without not waiting what bishops will say, uh, not uh, paying attention to their positions, uh, but rather doing what they consider is right and uh, um, is, uh, understanding that they are the church. So uh, that's, um, uh, for me, uh, one of the results uh, of, uh, of this up upheaval. Uh, more pressure is done, uh, more people feel need for freedom and uh, for this um, uh, so strong self-confidence. And um, uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's very promising and uh, I hope... Uh, yeah, one, one day we will see it not in hidden way, but in open way. All right. Natalia, I can't thank you enough. This has been so illuminating. Um, I know it's been very uh, stressful for you. I know you're very much involved in, in, in all of this. Um, you're, you're, you're in our prayers. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again in, in, uh, in happier times, maybe at the next IOTA conference. So, so, so thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, send us some public orthodoxy pieces um, all about this, and uh, we'll look forward to collaborating uh, again in the future. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for the invitation and thank you for, for interest in this problem, and I, I hope that uh, we will solve this problem uh, all together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And um, for this and, and more content like it, you can check out our uh, YouTube page or anything uh, at our homepage at uh, Fordham EDU slash orthodoxy. Thank you so much.